Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of you this morning who are here in person in this church building and who are joining us online from wherever you are in this world and also who will be joining us later perhaps through the video of this service. This morning if you have were here in the church service earlier if you were here at Sunday school time or have been looking at your notices in the bulletins, you will know we are starting a sermon series and on the God's story, God's song in the Bible. And so this morning we are focusing on the very beginning of that story, which would be the beginning of the book of Genesis. So this morning for our peace prayer, I invite you to think about some place in this universe that has to do with the environment and some place that you believe needs to be brought to God's shalom and peace and to hold that in silent prayer before God as I light the peace candle. We're going to combine a prayer for peace with our call to worship and our opening prayer. So that is going to be on the screen, I believe, as well as in your hymnals in 864, if you would prefer to follow it there. 
number 864, or on the screen. You will notice there is a leader part, and then each part is followed by everyone. We offer thanksgiving to our Creator, recalling that Christ is the center of creation and our lives as Christians. We're facing these directions in our mind, not in person. We're not going to turn around in our seats here. As we faced east, the direction of the rising sun, we offer thanks for the gifts of the tree world and for new beginnings. Help us to be honest with you and others and to be wise and just in our use of the resources of the earth. We give thanks to you, O oh God. As we face south, where we receive warmth, we offer thanks for the gifts of the animal world and for the call to be humble. Enable us to walk good paths, to live as family should, and with you to renew the face of the earth. We give thanks to you, O oh God. As we face west, where we receive teachings of faith, we offer thanks for the gifts of the rock world and the purifying and fruitful waters. Sustain us and the earth through your Holy Spirit and give us faith as strong as the rock. We give thanks to you, O oh God. As we face north, the direction of wind and snow, we offer thanks for the plant world and for kindness and wisdom. Breathe your strength and endurance into us and give us wisdom to treat each other with kindness. We give thanks to you, O oh God. As we face center, from above comes the unconditional love of God. From the earth comes the gift of life. We give thanks for love like the wings of the eagle. We dedicate our lives to you, our creator and savior. As we walk on this earth, may we learn together and celebrate the way of peace harmony, and tranquility. We give thanks to you, O oh God. Amen. Our first song this morning is Voices Together number 182.
work now? We'll use this one and trade off. So you still have a part. <laughs> Getting directions here. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep sea, and God's wind swept over the waters. God said, let there be light. And so light appeared. God saw how good the light was. God separated the light from the darkness. God named the light day and the darkness light night. The first day. God said, let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate the waters from each other. God made the dome and separated the waters under the dome from the waters above the dome. And it happened in that way. God named the dome sky. God said, let the waters under the sky come together into one place so that the dry land can appear. And that's what happened. God named the dry land earth and named the gathered waters seas. God saw how good it was. God said, let the earth grow plant life, plants yielding seeds and fruit trees bearing fruit with seeds inside it, each according to its kind throughout the earth. And that's what happened. The earth produced plant life, plants yielding seeds, each according to its kind, and trees bearing fruit with seeds inside it, each according to its kind. God saw how good it was. There was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day of, from the night. They will mark events, sacred seasons, days, and years. They will be lights in the dome to shine on the earth. And that's what happened. God made the stars into great lights. The larger light to rule over the day and the smaller light to rule over the night. God put them in the dome of the sky to shine on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw how good it was. God said, let the waters swarm with living things and let birds fly above the earth up in the dome of the sky. God created the great sea animals and all the tiny living things that swarm in the waters, each according to its kind, and all the winged birds, each according to its kind. God saw how good it was. Then God blessed them. Be fertile and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening and there was morning, the fifth day. God said, let the earth produce every kind of living thing, livestock, crawling things, and wildlife. And that's what happened. God made every kind of wildlife, every kind of livestock, and every kind of creature that crawl crawls on the ground. God saw how good it was. Then God said, let us make humanity in our image to resemble us so that they may take charge of the fish of the sea the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and all the crawling things on earth. God created humanity in God's own image. In the divine image, God created them. Male and female, God created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and master it. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and everything crawling on the ground. Then God said, I now give to you all the plants on the earth that yield seeds and all the trees whose fruit produces its seeds within it. These will be your food. To all wildlife, to all birds in the sky, and to everything crawling on the ground, to everything that breathes, I give all the green grasses for food. And that's what happened.
God saw everything God had made. It was supremely good. There was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. The heavens and the earth and all who live in them were completed. On the sixth day, God completed all the work God had done. And on the seventh day, God rested from all the work had been done. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all the work of creation. This is the time we honor our offerings to God. Offerings can be put in the box in the back of the church. They could be put in the church office. They could be mailed in. I'm not sure if there's an online option as well. So lots of ways to give. And so let us join in prayer. All good things around us come from you, God. As you have given us gifts, even life itself, so we offer our gifts and lives that we may be gifts to one another. Amen. The next hymn is number 802 in Voices Together. This song is um, something that we just kind of put in at the last minute because we thought that it was important to share one of the things, we're about to share the, a report from the special delegate session of Mennonite Church USA that happened in Kansas City uh, a week and a half ago, almost two weeks ago. Um, and this was a song that was kind of thematic for the event. So it's it's probably new to us. Um, it's, I don't know, maybe we've heard it before, but we're gonna sing it for the first time today and then follow that with our report. Draw the circle.
call Sherry Scheffler up to get started for our um, delegate report. Yeah, so on Memorial Day weekend, um, four of us from our church were present at the special delegate session. And you can see it was um, Tammy and myself went as the delegates for our congregation. Um, Jim Stuckey went as the delegate, as an, a delegate from Western District Conference, and Pastor Christine was an observer. So we'll, we'll switch sides. So there were four resolutions that we covered in that time. So we had the... I wish I had a prompt screen here, and I don't, I'm sorry. So we had the MCUSA polity and role of membership guidelines, a resolution for repentance and transformation, which was the resolution for inclusiveness of LGBTQIA, the for justice of the US criminal legal system, and the MCUSA um, accessibility resolution. So Friday morning, I mean Friday evening, we arrived and we did worship together and we're introduced to the song. On Saturday, it started out with reviewing group norms like we did and we learned about in our peaceful practices class. And then we had a discussion to retire the MCUSA membership guidelines. And then um, we had an intermittent thing there where we discussed and voted whether or not to add the repentance and transformation inclusive resolution to the agenda because it was not officially on the agenda we had to vote to make it to put it there and the results of that vote are next and so it was decided to put that on the agenda for the following day so go ahead and go on Okay, so then on Sunday morning, we had worship with Samuel Sapira, which was actually the same sermon that you guys got to share here. Um, so we thought that was unique and nice that you guys got to enjoy the same sermon that we were getting at the MCUSA Special Delegate Session. Okay, and then we did our discussion and vote on the membership guidelines resolution, and the vote results were... Again, they passed overwhelmingly to retire the membership guidelines. Sunday afternoon, we had rotating table discussion on the inclusive resolution for repentance and transformation. Then we had larger group discussion on that um, same resolution. And then there was a motion and vote to table that resolution. There was, I will just say from my standpoint, during all the discussions, there was a lot of support for the fact that an injustice has been done, um, not including LGBTQ, but there wasn't a lot of support for the strong language of the resolution. A lot of people felt like it could be reworded to not be as strong and divisive for the conference. Um, so it wasn't surprising that at the end of all the discussions, somebody made a motion to table it um, and I, it seemed like most people thought that was going to give us a chance to rewrite the language, and then they were going to table it until the next year at our regular session. Then it was announced that the rules are if you table a discussion, it comes, a res if you table a resolution, when it comes back, it comes back exactly the same as it was when you tabled it. Um, so then we voted on that, and those results are as follows. And so overwhelmingly, we decided not to table it because it really wasn't achieving what was thought originally. Okay, go on to the next slide. So after that was decided, then we did more table discussion about the resolution and had the vote on the repentance and transformation resolution, which were fo as follows. So it was very close. Everything else was very distinctly one way or the other. This one, it passed by 54%, or 50, I'm sorry, almost 56% for the repentance and transformation resolution. I did, the one note I wanted to make about that was, again, like I said, it seemed like there was 
not consensus on the wording and the language. It felt like there was consensus, well, fairly large consensus on that an injustice had been happening. And our discussion was, or the thoughts that came to me in our table discussion, it was brought up, well, if there's an injustice, it needs to stop. You don't say, well, we've been wronging you and harming you, so we'll decrease the amount of harm and then eventually we'll get to where we aren't harming you, but can you be bear with us another 10 or 20 years, you know, or whatever long it may be? That just doesn't seem right. Um, and then, but yet there were still a lot of people that were saying, I don't know if this is the right wording. And so, Tammy, did you wanna explain about the, or you'll do it later. We, at the beginning of the session, we had the very first morning, we had a, assignment to build a symbol of radical hope for the weekend as a table together with whatever craft items were on our table. And when I was, when we were at the last part of discussion and just preparing to vote on the resolution, my mind, I was really praying for God to give me, for the Holy Spirit to give me an idea, a sense of which way to vote. I felt like I knew, but I wasn't certain I wanted to feel like I was listening for the Holy Spirit and what came into my head at that moment was looking at this everybody created their own this was Tammy's and she'll tell you more about it in a minute but looking at the symbol of radical hope in our table that they had had us create the word radical and radical justice came into my head and I thought radical justice is what Jesus was all about. And radical justice may not be popular, but that was Jesus' way. And so for me, I felt like it was clear to vote for the resolution. Okay, and then that was the end of a very long day because that day went long because of all that. And then the, finally on Monday morning we had worship and then we addressed the next two resolutions. The one for justice on the criminal, U.S. criminal system was a study resolution so there was no voting, it was just discussion. And then we discussed um, and voted for the accessibility resolution. And we didn't even have to do paper ballots, it passed unanimously by show of hands. There were no votes for dissent or abstention. So, so that's a quick overview of the chronology and then Pastor Christine and Tammy are going to speak a little bit and then we'll have Jim come up. I was there as an observer, as an observer of process and how, how were they going to be hosting these conversations? How do we how do they balance the small group conversations with the speaking from the pulp, from a, not the pulpit, but a microphone? One of the things they did was they put out these three big sheets of cards of paper on each table. And they were kind of like the, the norms or the expectations that we developed at the beginning of peaceful practices. They have one for general, which is about how do you, what's in your head and your heart as you walk in the door. You're going to honor people's dignity, you're going to minimize interruptions, those kinds of things. The next one that they uh, shared was one about listening. How do you use your ears when other people are speaking? You will want to listen deeply, not just so that you can respond, but listen deeply so you truly understand. You want to lean into the discomfort and tension so that you really get what is going on. And three more things. They had a sheet for speaking. This was the one that um, gave me extra conversation in the peanut gallery where I was sitting with no peanuts. Um, it, the, the item was separate Im intention from impact. This is a hard thing, and we never really talked about it in our conversations here, and so I wanted to highlight it as important. And I'll tell you that copies of these three sheets are on the bulletin board out there, the, the, main, the, the big one that's got posters and things. But separating intention from impact is a really crucial thing in all sorts of our work with isms. Racism, sexism, 
isms, 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 like classism, thinking that people of a certain class are worth more in the world than people of another class, or education. So sometimes our words land differently than we intend them to, and we don't always catch on to how they are landing. So it's not my judgment call to tell how my words are landing. I had a friend who called me on a racist epithet that I didn't think was a, it was a, it was a metaphor I was using, and she said it was racist, and I didn't think it was, but it wasn't my place to make that call. It was hers. She was a person of color. She could tell me that that lands as a racist thing. So making a distinction between how I think so I'm intending to say something and how it lands, learning from the person who is hearing it and feeling it offensive, it's my place to learn. Just like it's my place to speak about something that lands sexist to me as a woman. So that was uh, a really helpful part of the, of the way they prepared um, the delegates to have these conversations. All right. So um, for a little bit of the flavor of the discussion, which I think the flavor of conversation is one thing that is really important to share. So Sherry had mentioned the, the symbols that our table created. So our table, my table had people from, let's see, there was a pastor from New York City, there was a pastor from a small town in Georgia, there was a pastor from a very traditional Mennonite congregation in Pennsylvania. Um, there was a man from Florida, from Sarasota, and a pastor from um, Ohio, from an inner city church. So we had a very wide variety of people. And on these resolutions, we had a variety of perspectives. But before we even got started talking about that, we talked about our hope was that we could bring all of these different pieces, the different places we were from, the very, very different congregations we came from, and we could bring them all together. So here I have three different colors of pipe cleaner. And they're all joined together by the thing in the center of our conversation, which is Jesus. So I use the symbol of the cross because that was easier than trying to create an actual person in pipe cleaners. Um, so some people came wanting to feel and share love as being the main thing that came out of our conversations. Some were feeling like they were possibly going to be in kind of a whirlwind because their congregations had not already had difficult conversations about how do you include or even to include LGBTQIA plus people. Other people at my table were part of that com community and so we had very different places we were coming from. And in the room as a whole, there were people from all those different places. But yet, the main sense that I got out of the um, whole meeting, the whole weekend, was the idea that while there is this one issue that has divided the Mennonite church for the last 20 years and more even, that there is so much that we share in common 
and the one thing that is missing. So we put the world in the middle of our circle because we want to make that circle wider, like the song talked about. But we also had then a dove, and I don't know what happened to our Play-Doh kind of dove. It sometimes looked like a bird and sometimes looked like a lump of Play-Doh, depending on what had, how many times it had fallen off of the world. <laughs> but to keep in the center our shared love for Christ and our shared understanding of what it means to be followers of Christ. So in our discussion of the resolutions that we're focusing mostly around human sexuality, we had very different opinions, but we could easily share and support with each other because of that shared love. And I know, I hope that my table is a little microcosm of what can be for Mennonite Church USA, that we can move on, probably not immediately, but we can move beyond and just focus on the other things that bind us all together, like the last two resolutions we talked about on Monday, or I guess one wasn't a resolution, but anyway, so... That's the main thing. So we had congregations represented that were fully in favor of the language, the very strong language, saying that we have done wrong to people who are from the LGBTQIA plus community. Okay, we had people who could tell their stories of how that had impacted them somehow they had still stayed part of the Mennonite church. I honestly don't know how. But we also had people who were afraid that their congregation would leave because of that strong language. So the conversation, what I want to emphasize to you and to anybody else that I talked to about this, was that the Mennonite Church USA is not the conversation did not show that we are in a place where we are going to go and immediately rewrite the um, confession of faith or anything like that. But that we are in a place where we can say some people have been harmed and we want to move forward as a united church on things like criminal justice reform. There was a lot of support for what was in that resolution from everyone, talking about how our prison system is not really one that actually focuses on reforming and helping people to do better, but is focused on punishment. And so that's something that we could all agree on. We could also easily very easily all agree on the accessibility, wanting to make it so our congregations are a place that welcome people of all disabilities and trying to give resources to congregations to make that happen. As a delegate from Western District, I'm this morning going to try to give a, a few um, thoughts and perspectives coming from that, uh, that venue. Um, these, of course, are my own thoughts and ideas, and I don't represent Western District in any way. That's sort of a disclaimer. To uh, start my report this morning, I want to take you back two decades, that's 20 years, to the annual session of the Western District Conference on July 7, 2002, when the Peace and Social Concerns Committee put a statement on their information table for distribution. In this statement, 
the committee while recognizing the intense feelings and divisiveness that homosexuality elicits, goes on to say, as a justice issue, we as a committee feel compelled to add our voice to those who welcome Christians of homosexual orientation as full contributing members of the body of Christ. It may interest you to know that Harold Regeer, member of our church, was the chair of that committee, and also Eric Buller was a member. This action <coughs> set off a firestorm of protest, primarily but not only from the Oklahoma churches. After numerous meetings and consultations with the executive committee and the Oklahoma churches, the Peace and Social Concerns Committee issued an additional statement. In part, they said, we sincerely apologize for the mistrust, anguish, and confusion and suspicion that our statement has caused. We value your conviction and commitment to our relationship as you have helped us understand your congregation's concerns and emotions incited by our statement. Even though the committee made this apology, they did not withdraw their statement. It seems that the die was cast. We will now fast forward to a decade later, that's 10 years, in 2012, when Western District Conference appointed a Human Sexuality Discernment Task Force. That task force worked diligently for over a year to hear and compile all viewpoints about the question of inclusiveness and acceptance of same-sex oriented persons into our congregations. Our efforts culminated in a day-long symposium held here at Faith Church in the Fellowship Hall. We anticipated around 60 participants, but had to cut it off at 120 for lack of space. The title of the day was The Church and Homosexuality, a conversation that can hold us together. It was an exhausting day with speeches and various perspectives followed by directed conversation around tables and open mic time. In conjunction with that symposium, the task force commissioned Ted Swartz, uh, many of you may know who, who Ted Swartz is, um, to write and present a drama he entitled, A Peek Into the Church's Journey with Sexuality. The story of how that came about is a personal one that I'd be glad to share with you sometime. The play was presented in Crable Auditorium to a sold out crowd. Every seat was filled with standing room only. This became the premier production of Listening for Grace, which Ted presented many places and times in the US and Canada. I highlight these two events simply because I was personally involved and also because they fell very neatly into a trajectory of decades of time. So now we leap another decade to the reports that you have heard this morning about the special delegate session in Kansas City. And I commend the people who made those reports. I think they captured very well uh, the mood that was established there. However, their questions still remain. Will the resolution that was passed, and it was a rather narrow margin, help us turn the corner on this topic? The cautious side of me says, it only means that there were a few more people there who were in favor than there were who were against. I don't know that any minds were changed. Only time and attrition will tell it may interest you to know that all of the churches who were protesting the statement made 20 years ago are no longer part of Western District Conference. On a wider church level, in our efforts to embrace diversity, are we becoming less diverse? What direction is our action moving that the, is, is our action moving the indicator needle? 
Finally, I want to leap ahead another decade. Yes, that's 10 years from now. That's a span of 30 years from the time our committee first placed their statement on the table in Plano, Texas. I don't know if I will be here or not. I hope to be, but this is one thing I do know. I pray that the topic of inclusion and welcome of queer folks into our churches is no longer part of our conversation. We will value and treat everyone with the same respect and love.
Continuing the story in our Bible, chapter 2, verse 3. Chapter 2, verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth, and before any field crops grew, because the Lord God had not yet sent rain on the earth, and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all of the fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into their nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human that had been formed. In the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruit and also grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows from Eden to water the garden and from there it divides into four headwaters. The name of the first water is Pishon. It flows around the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. That land's gold is pure, and the land also has sweet-smelling rosins and gemstones. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It flows around the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, flowing east of Assyria, and the name of the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the human and settled him in the Garden of Eden to farm it and to take care of it. The Lord God commanded the human, eat your fill from all of the garden's trees, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because on the day you eat from it, you will die. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. The human gave each living being its name. The human named all the livestock, all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But a helper perfect for him was nowhere to be found. So the Lord God put the human into a deep and heavy sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh over it. With the rib taken from the human, the Lord God fashioned a woman and brought her to the human being. The human said, this one finally is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because from a man she was taken. This is the reason that a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife, and they become one flesh. The two of them were naked, and the man and his wife, but they were not embarrassed. These are stories we know, right? And yet, there's maybe something more to think about them, which is why I'm here to talk about it. Join me in prayer to get us started. Oh God, our beginnings are in you. You created the earth and you created us all to live in harmony with each other. Be with us today as we study our beginnings. Amen. There's a big question that we often ask when we study the Bible. What's the environment that this passage lands in? Bible scholars study context or historical criticism or even rhetorical criticism. But anyway, a core assertion that arises is often, this passage was written and written in this particular way because it was responding to something. The prevailing cultural story, how people thought, what they believed, who they worshiped, 
was a real active phenomenon that the people of God, including writers of God's stories, needed to respond to, to counter with a different story. Some of you would have been present four weeks ago when I preached about the revelation of John, the prevailing cultural story, the normal thing to think that John of Patmos was countering was worship of the emperor and portraying the emperor or the empire as a beast was pretty countercultural. That's in one line, a, a summary of that sermon. Today, we've heard the two Abrahamic creation stories, the seven days of creation and the Garden of Eden story. You know, I grew up, maybe you did too, thinking they were the same story, but it turns out that their writing styles are dramatically different, and so it's clear that they came from two different sources. Both landed in the, at the beginning of Genesis. So first today, what we'll do is look at the stories, what's going on, what's emphasized in the telling. Second, we'll note when they were written and what prevailing cultural story they were countering. And then third, we'll consider what stories we counter today. I may as well also tell you what I'm not, I'm not doing. I'm not debating how old the earth is and whether the Genesis creation story describes the literal creation of the earth or not. I actually agree with a commentator, Hendel, whose introduction and footnotes are found in the HarperCollins Study Bible, which I use. He says, it is somewhat unfair to note the scientific inadequacies of Genesis since it was not written to be a, a work of modern science. We need to learn to read Genesis on its terms recognize its ancient voice, and not superimpose on it our own voice. It is a book of memories, of marvels and miracles, imperfect saints and holy sinners, a beneficent and often inscrutable God, and promises that bind the past to the present and to the future. It, it tells us where we came from, not in the sense that the book is historically accurate, but in the sense that the book itself is our historical root. So to me, it's a red herring, an unhelpful distraction to get embroiled in young earth or evolution debates. It misses the other points the text is making. So I think I'm gonna find up on my screen the chart of the days and words and actions of the, of the seven days story. And you'll see that too. You'll see the first three. Oh yeah, the first four lines with the days and words at the top and day three at the bottom. So there's let there be light on day one, separates light from dark and um, day from night. Day two, let there be a dome separating the waters above from the, from the ocean below, ocean from clouds. Day three, let the ocean gather into one and the dry land appear and let the earth put forth vegetation. So we have seas from earth, plants yielding seed and trees bearing fruit. And then something that is helpful to recognize these three days are about creation, and the second three days will be about population, like filling that creation with. So we create in the first three days. Let's go to the second section. Let there be day four, let there be lights in the sky to mark the days, nights, and season, sun, moon, and stars. Day five, let the waters bring forth creatures and let birds fly fish and birds. Day six, let the earth bring forth living creatures and let us make humankind in our image. And we get land animals, creeping, wild and domestic, and we get humans, male and female. And in the Hebrew, that is a poem. So the, cre the creation of the first three days has population where the on day four, Sky lights populate the sky, the, day, the light of day one. 
on day five, sea and sky animal, animals populates the sea and sky that are created on day two. On day six, land animals and plants as food, that populates the land and, and plants that were created on day three. And day seven, God rests, bless the seventh day and hallow it. Then there's the Adam and Eve story. And I'm going to find where I talk about that. Yeah, then there's the story of the Garden of Eden. We know that best as the best place in history, the most ideal, a safe place, food to eat, a loving God who created it for us, and a gentle creation from dust, the origins of humanity. Adam and Eve as the prototype humans who are given so much. Our God acts out of love to create and relate to his creation. So it's about love and creation and relationship. And then there's another creation story. Other cultures around the Hebrews had their creation stories as well. We'll look at one of them, which was conveniently placed, like right near the Hebrews. This one was the Babylonian creation story, the Enuma Elish. The image, uh, which I think is like a relief carving on, in stone, is called Chaos Monster and Sun God. The sun god is Marduk. The composition of this myth probably dates to the late second millennium BCE, meaning 1900 to 1600 years before the birth of Jesus, a long time ago. The archeological evidence comes in the form of clay tablets on which are recorded between 115 and 170 lines of cuneiform script. I'm going to read you the first eight lines as they are translated. When on high the heaven had not been named, firm ground below had not been called by name, not but primordial Apsu, their begetter, and Tiamat, she who bore them all, their waters commingling as a single body. No reed hut had been matted, no marsh land had appeared, when no gods whatever had been brought into being, uncalled by name, their destinies undetermined. Then it was that the gods were formed within them. So that's the first, the first eight lines. The seven, I think seven tablets that are, um, that continue this story, each have m many lines on them. So the primordial entities created the gods. They and the gods argued, they taunted each other, they fought, they destroyed each other in a soap opera style story. One cast a spell to make another sleep and stole his halo. Such shenanigans. Eventually, one of them surpassed the others. He was called Marduk, the sun god, what you see on the right there. One of his battles was with one of the 11 monsters made by the primordial watery Tiamat. And this image is called, again, Chaos Monster and Sun God. So tablet two starts, Ea heard of Tiamat's plan to fight and avenge Apsu. He spoke to his grandfather Anshar, telling that many gods had gone to Tiamat's cause. That kind of thing. Tablet three starts, Anshar spoke to Gaga, who advised him to fetch Lamu and Lahamu and tell them of Tiamat's war plans, etc. Tablet four, Marduk was given a throne and sat over the other gods who honored him. And eventually, all that drama gives way to the creation story itself. The Babylonian creation story where Marduk shot Tiamat with an arrow and split her remains in two. That's what he used to make the sky, the moon, and the constellations. He created clouds and rain, and their water made the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, modern-day Iraq, you know. 
he used the blood sacrifice of one of the gods to create humans to serve the gods. Then the gods made a lot of bricks and built the city of Babylon and Marduk's throne and had a banquet. That's the story. In Babylon, it's known by everyone. It's their normal. Who else is watching? For whom is this not the way it's always been? Along about 587 BCE, Babylon defeated Judah, and a big group of Hebrews got taken into exile in Babylon, where they can actually see the culture in action that they might have heard of from travelers. Just like what we would do, they talked about what they noticed. They had doorway conversations or marketplace conversations, like today we would have coffee shop conversations. We're noticing a difference between the way of the world, the prevailing cultural story, how the world thinks it works, and the way of our faith. And we talk about it. One fine day in Babylon, then, a parade of the Enuma Elish creation story is processing down the street toward the annual Akitu festival. Or maybe it's not a parade. Maybe it's just a reenactment of the tale of the Enuma Elish on an outdoor stage. Either way, you watch the drama play out. Wow, the violence the selfishness, the trickery. And you compare it to who God has been for you and your people. Wow, what an amazing spectacle, you might say. What a chaotic story. How mean the gods are to each other. How utterly irrelevant the humans are to them. Just slaves, humans. What we have is so much different, better. Our God created the world and us out of love, not violence, and seeks to be in wholesome relationship with us, loving and guiding us and providing for us. God led our ancestors, and God sends prophets continuing to lead us, Moses gave us such a loving and clear message from our God, giving us good nudges to be our best, responsible to our families, kind and generous to strangers. So when we look at what our world is rooted in and think about how God roots us in this year, 2022, North Newton, Kansas, Newton, Kansas, the values of God's way what do we notice between the values of God's way and the way of the world? The way of God is the way of creation. The song in our Bible curriculum this year has as its closing refrain every, every time, God loves every one of us, it's true, and God loves the universe. Thus, we care for God's creation. Our stewardship, care to prevent overuse and waste, taking for ourselves just what we need and no more. These values are rooted in the creation story of a God of love. Last week, a group of us gathered in the fellowship hall, Wednesday evening, and what we were doing and why is precisely what I'm talking about. This, we noticed, and we are deeply troubled by the epidemic of gun violence in our country. This is enabled by a cultural story that says the bigger the gun, the safer you are. It's in our movies from nearly the beginning of movies and before that. It's also enabled by a political system that rewards candidates with the most success at raising money no matter where it comes from. And keeping big donors like gun manufacturers can give you a big enough advertising budget to keep you in Congress. But our God is a God of love who weeps with parents everywhere and through time when their children are killed. And so last Wednesday, we shared our holy tears. 
for the loss of life. We wrote postcards and we ate pizza. We called our legislators to account, making them aware that we care and we are watching. Other responses will occur to us, responses noticing the distinction between the way the world works and the values of our God. We will act on other prompts as well. The question stands, how does the way of our loving creator stand in tension with the ways of the world? And what are we called to do about it? This is, in fact, a way of phrasing the question for our summer transition work. What are we called to do about the things that deny the kingdom? Hang on to that when you have things that occur to you. Anything, a sermon or otherwise, that gets you excited about the potential for Faith Mennonite Church to make a difference on behalf of the kingdom of God, bring that with you when you come in two weeks to the session at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, June 26th. That is our work. How is God calling us to be part of God's work? God, be in our heads, in our hearts, in our hands, and our creative work on behalf of God's kingdom. Amen. We've had a lot of talking already, and I'm not going to talk long during this transition moment. What I, talk, what I mentioned in the sermon is called World Cafe. It's a large room full of round tables where people have conversations and work with each other to do something fresh. That's what it's called, World Cafe. We'll do that in two weeks, table conversations. Let's sing our closing song. This is God's Wondrous World. It's a little bit edited from the earlier text, but very much the same. Number 180.
The tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high, will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Amen. <laughs>